Ah, I see all of you have arrived. Wonderful. Mm. She closes her book. Takes her feet down from her desk. She looks over her glasses. I hope visiting hours were fun. Ah, <sighs> so... She really doesn't look interested. What's it going to be there today? How are we going to educate your young and troubled minds? Oh, good news. Um, who uh, were you? Oh yes, Tobin and Emily, wasn't it? Hmm. Yes, yes, those are your names. I remember, yes, your art the um, other day was really good, really good. And I got contacted by a friend who would really, really like to show one of those pieces off. So congratulations, everyone in the class. Give Tobin a round of applause. I give a round of applause at the back, though again, I'm not even here, really. My mind is just trying to compartmentalise, trying to make things seem less scary by treating it like a game. That's how I was treating it when I came here in the first place. It was a game, and this is a different game. So, it's calming me, and yeah, I just clap as I look at Tobin. I stand up and uh, I make some stupid sarcastic bows. It's not really my thing to be clowning like this, but I just need to do something. Mo Raman throws a ball of paper at your head. <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, most kind. Okay, everybody, settle down, settle down. Well, now we're going to play a game. That's uh, that's right, I've been thinking. I've been thinking, what's a good way to stimulate young minds? And I've been thinking, people love games, don't they? Children love games. You love playing in the playground. We don't really have much of a playground here. We certainly don't have any sporting equipment. So I thought we could play a game together. It's, uh, it, it might, I guess, inspire some of you. Okay? So, I want all the boys on one side of the class, all the girls on the other side of the class, anyone in the middle, um, we're all modern here, uh, can go whichever side they prefer, frankly. I kind of look a bit confused and start standing on the side of the boys. Yeah, the other... Youths start scraping their chairs back, getting to their feet, walking over to the sides of the class. Yeah, I just follow along with whatever the class is supposed to be this time. Okay, so this game is a game I like to play. It's a little like a game I like to play. I mean, the game I like to play is a bit adults only. <laughs> uh, I know some of you older children will know what I'm talking about and it's a little it's a little like never have I ever something like that now there's not going to be any drinking I didn't bring any booze not to share with you anyway but anyone of you who cannot say never have I ever to something another one of you says has got to step forward Okay, just take small steps because we want to see who gets to the middle of the class. Which of you are living the most dangerous of lives? That sounds exciting, doesn't it? Now, here's the fun bit. You, When you say, never have I ever, you have to say something that you have done. See, it's a bit of a reversal. So, for instance, I would say... oh. Never have I ever had sex in a cemetery. <laughs> and I would step forward. And anyone else who had would as well. I know, I know, it's a little inappropriate for youths, but... I look around, kind of, fuck. Okay, well, let's start with our master artist. Uh, Tobin, Tobin. Never have I ever what? Um... What have you done? What naughty things have you got up to? Never have I ever skipped a class. Oh, there's a lot of shuffling feet there. Do all three of you step forward? 
can I ask how the, the medication is affecting Emily, if at all? It is affecting Emily, and it's making your vision quite blurry around the edges at this point. Everything is pinpoint. Well, uh, Emily steps forward, but um, not very agile. You feel Francis supporting you slightly. Well, that was a bit of a naughty one. I hope you don't miss any of my classes. <laughs> I understand if you miss Mr. Greeps. He is ever such a... Well, he can be very stiff, can't he? Now, let's see. Mo, Mo, uh, I know we, we've been through this game many times, Mo, so try and come up with something new for me. Never have I ever... Hmm. Beaten someone until they bled. And he takes a big step forward. I wrinkle my nose and stay where I am. To be perfectly honest, I have no interest in playing this game, but I'm keeping an eye out because I also, I don't know, maybe if I'm the only one who doesn't take a step at some point, I'll get picked on. So, are many people stepping forward for that one? There's a surprising amount of honesty uh, from some of these pupils who actually seem quite proud of the fact that they have beaten people until they bled. Uh, how about Emily and Tobin? Any movement from them? I just put on a poker face. I have not done this, but I feel like I'm going to I'm going to take on something of a bad boy mask. People don't know too much about me still. I'll take a step. Emily doesn't step anywhere. Francis does. She looks over her shoulder at you behind her now and shrugs. You find your standing even more wobbly than before. Now that you lack any supports. Well... That's an exciting one, Mo. Didn't expect bloodshed so early. So, how about Damien? Damien, you're the one that suggested the art class that time. I found it such an inspiring thing. What racy confession do you have for the group? Uh, I don't know. Um, okay. Something that you have done. Again, I try and feign thinking about it when I really can't be past with this stupid game even Miss Edgewood is this is this something she enjoys is, is, is this some sort of thing going on again she seems the least awful out of all these adults here and yet probably is just as bad but still all right I think something that actually is useful never have I ever run away from home I step forward Tobin um I take like a small step that could be a, a non-step as well Emily Emily steps forward as you do so you totter uh, you're level with Frances again and you find yourself leaning against her very heavily indeed could you make a let's go for a reflexes roll please yes all right I get 15. Very nice. Very nice. You find yourself clutching on to Frances' sleeve and she pushes you away slightly. She clearly doesn't like this much of an invasion of her personal space. You can still use her as support, but she doesn't want you nestling into her side. You kind of briefly look over, noticing this going on with Emily and this girl. I'm sure I know that girl's name, but very suspicious. But I look to Miss Edgewood instead. After all, I know that's a lie. I've never run away from home. But maybe if she sees me doing this later on, she'll tell Miss Crow that I step forward, and then that will confirm Miss Crow, who was suspicious of me earlier. Edgewood is smiling at you as you take your step forward. Mm, well... People stepping forward a little faster than I perhaps anticipated. So let's see, who should we go for next? I think we're going to pick on... Uh, 
Lardy Hardy. Uh, this was the kid who was outside who had all the snacks uh, on your day of arrival. Uh, Jim Hardy. And it's a bit surprising that Edgewood is referring to him by such a cruel name. Well, Lardy, never have you ever... What, don't? And you can't say never have I ever uh, <laughs> refused to eat a full portion. I look over to him. Uh, never have I ever... And he starts crying. Never. <laughs> oh, it's, it's... It's just a game, Lardy. Come on, there has to be something naughty you want to confess to. Come on, Hardy. <laughs> Never. By ever. Never have I ever... Never have I ever wanted to... Never have I ever tried to kill myself. And he takes a step forward. A few of the other children do. Damien? I look down at the ground. The answer is no, of course not, but... I feel for this kid, hell feel for the others who step forward as well and I just get really angry again because yeah yeah this place she's in on it this is this is just fucked up and Tobin I stand my ground my muscles tighten as I look at Mrs Edgewood she's just sank in my eyes and Emily Emily stepped forward it's more of a lurch forward as Francis doesn't go anywhere I think let's do another reflexes roll please alright I rolled 18 you manage to maintain your balance stand up straight it's a little like how when a an incredibly drunk person makes an over-concerted effort to stand up straight and breathe deeply and clear their head. It never works, but for a few seconds you seem fine. For long enough for Mrs. Edgewood to address you. Emily, that was a bold step forward. No shame on your shoulders, I see. So, never have you ever what? Emily opens her mouth. And her mind is racing. She's feeling all of the eyes in the classroom on her. She knows she is affected by the medication. She knows she has blood on her sleeves, dust in her hair. She knows she looks pale. She knows she's already a target. Her underlip is shivering as she stammers. Never have I ever... Um, E eaten chocolate after bedtime. Edgewood smiles so broadly, almost unnaturally so. There's a little bit of confusion among some of the youths, but then a bunch of them stand forward. I stand still. I don't ever eat chocolate. I stand still as well, simply because I wouldn't eat it after bedtime because I thought to brush my teeth and it just gets irritating when you eat things after you brush your teeth. But I do pay attention to Miss Edgewood and that smile, trying to glean some meaning from it if I can. 
I don't know. Make a soul roll, please. Damien. Hmm. That is... Ten. What you see before you, and what looks straight back at you, is a person utterly lacking in weight, honour, reason, mercy, compassion. You see someone who may as well just be a husk, someone who is just capable of taking shallow joys, and the shallowest of joys comes through the suffering of others. She doesn't seem terribly unusual. She just seems utterly heartless. And her smile moves over to you. Do you like what you see? Oh, sorry, that's inappropriate. Woman my age. Boy your age. Anyway. Game's over. I think we all learned some interesting truths about ourselves. Someone carry Emily back to her desk. I think, looking at the blood on her sleeve, she's probably going to pass out in a minute. Um... Don't worry, though. We'll get you through the rest of the class, Emily, unless you want to go to Dr. Crow's now. No, no. No, no. Didn't think so. Didn't think so. That's all right. At which point, there's a knock on the door. Miss Edgewood, I am sorry to interrupt. It's Mr. Greep. There is a call for Tobin. Tobin, which one are you? Tobin Waltz? <clears throat> I stand up. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Creep. There is a call for you in the staff room. Follow me. I feel a bit confused. Uh, I nod and I go after him. As you leave the room, I give you a bit of a look, looking genuinely interested in what you're up to. And curious. I uh, see you. Uh, our eyes kind of meet for a second, and I just give a tiniest of shrugs as I leave. We spoke the other day, didn't we? About the history of this place. Uh, yes, and uh, you talked about the father a bit, uh, and uh, the religious words that he <laughs> spoke. Hmm. Yes. Hope you're not swallowing too much of uh, Edgewood's bile. Um, she doesn't really seem to want to teach much. If Who you does? Who does? Uh, anyway, it's one of your parents on the phone. Make it quick. It's the only phone in the building. Yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. Creep. He doesn't leave. He stands there in the doorway watching you. The staff room is a smoky little office with a sofa, a couple of chairs, a small kitchenette, and bathroom. It looks barely used, but it's among the best furnished parts of the center, to be honest. Unsurprising, really, given that this is where the adults come. The staff room is actually on the same floor as the room through which you entered the walls. Mm. Just pick up the receiver and talk, I'm sure you know how. I go over to the phone and I pick it up. Uh, hello? Listen, I am watching you. I told you I'm watching you. Uh, y yeah. Hi. Are you being washed right now? Uh, oh yeah, it's one of our teachers is here. I uh, nod towards Mr. Greep. Ah, uh, can't see him, I'm afraid. Anyway, there's a way out for you and your friends. You stay strong. And I'll end this pain soon enough. Just do what I said. Okay? Do you understand that? Yes. 
What? Your friend Emily isn't going to take much more of this. I wished I could reach through and help her when she was just carving at her skin. And I couldn't. I couldn't because you need to bring me here. I bite my lip. And trusting now in what he says, that would explain why she looked like she did. Not why she's acting like she, I mean, is wobbling around though. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I miss you too. Yeah. Well, you won't have to miss me for long, son, because all you have to do is what I asked and I'll come along. Just don't believe a word Dr. Crow tells you, okay? Yeah. Um, of oh, the, uh, radio. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, oh, you wanted to know about that? Yeah. They, uh, uh they're going to put it in the basement, but I, I figured I don't need that anymore. <laughs> the voice on the other end hangs up. Right. Yeah, no, uh, 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 yeah, it was nice seeing you, and um, thank you for for coming. Um, I'll, I'll be out really soon, I'm sure. Bye. <clears throat> uh, yeah, no, that was... Uh, yeah, they, they just wanted to ask about where I, I, I put a thing. A radio? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A radio. So, yeah, one of my dad's uh, 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 pet, pet projects, really. He, uh, ah, back at your house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, things we did before, you know. Help me clean up my classroom. Edward won't need you much longer. Sure. How, how long have you been here? Long enough. Start walking down the corridor with him, then. Silence is golden. If I want something, I will talk to you. You do not have to ask me questions, you understand? Yes, sir. Hmm, good. What do you think of Edgewood? Um... I mean, to look at her. How does she look? She's a good-looking, middle-aged woman. In the sense that she is all in the correct proportions. She has a certain air of traditional attractiveness to her, albeit a little weather-worn. But by no means is she... I guess by no means is she ugly. Uh, she has a mature quality to her, a sort of Mrs. Robinson quality. I just look back at him a bit incomprehensively for him to elaborate. Well, let me put it this way. Pick those books up over there. Put them in a stack. Thank you. Hmm. If she were to... If you were outside of this place and she were to proposition you, <laughs> what do you think you'd do? Pro I mean, come on, I, I don't, I'm 14. I... 14, 15, 16? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, she, she wanted to... I tried to take on some kind of cool attitude, which is very teenage-esque. I mean, yeah, I mean... Yes, yes, of course you would. Of course you would. Don't know a man here that wouldn't. Yeah. She... She seems a bit interested in... some kids. Hmm. I think she would... anything that moved, to be honest. Um, Do you know the reason she's here? I just shake my head as I pick the books. Do you want me to tell you? I look at him and I, and I shrug. Sure. Can you keep a secret, Tobin Waltz? Uh, yeah. Edgewood was 
caught at her old school accessing pornography on school computers. She's an IT teacher. <laughs> I try to keep from laughing, but it kind of bubbles over a bit. Yes, I laughed when I found out. She's had a teaching license stripped from her. <laughs> but she can still teach here. Well, this job isn't exactly teaching. I guess not. It's more like playing games. Care. Care. We care. We're like surrogate parents in here. Yeah. Yeah, she's, I... got, she's got something of a... habit. She does like to flirt and show a bit of leg. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, but does it ever lead to something with the kids, I mean? Oh, I'd hope not. That would be wrong. <laughs> um, I keep hearing that... I mean, teachers seem to keep saying that, Oh, they're not the worst one. Oh, they're not the worst one. Again, I said silence is golden. I didn't ask for your opinion on that. I take a pause as I stack the books uh, but finish your thought I just wondered who is this supposedly worst one <laughs> seeing Mr. Greep laugh is a bit disturbing whenever he talks it's like his jaw is wired shut and he doesn't betray much emotion on his face. But when he laughs, his mouth opens and closes with each ha. Like a ventriloquist dummy. It's unnatural. Hmm. Ask a different person, you'll get a different answer, Tobin Waltz. From my perspective, the worst is the person that brought us all here. I don't buy into the idea of psychology, medicines, and therapies. The idea that you can't just get over your problems by gritting your teeth and pushing forward shoulders first. That's how you get through a problem. You don't drug it away. Or you become dependent on the drugs. You don't therapize it away. Because as soon as your therapist changes, you've got to start the same story again and again and again. Just look at his jaw working as he talks. No. Dr. Crow has her methods. They get her paid. She undoubtedly believes in what she does. But frankly... You couldn't pay me to see a therapist. No. Um, hmm. Or uh, you just uh, keep it in then? You don't keep it in, you work it out. You think about it. You write it. You act on it. If you've got an urge, you expel it. Right. How do you think monks managed it in the Dark Ages? You don't think that they were drawn to do things that were considered morally impure? Well, and yet, know. they managed it, didn't they? Because they were people of iron will, and some of us are people of iron will. They wrote things down? It was a rhetorical question. Do you know what that means? Not really. It means it doesn't really have an answer that I need to hear. Alright. Silence is golden. Silence is golden. You're learning. Still, I suppose Dr. Crow does have some benefits. She speaks to the children, and when they come out of her office, they're always changed to some degree. 
Maybe on some level it's making them better and fit for society. Uh, how did how long does someone have to stay here to become a prefect? Oh, you want to get on the prefect track? Well, that's very aspirational of you after but sh such a short time here. What, a couple of weeks? And I just think back, like it felt like it's just been two days. Uh, time is hard to grasp. Uh. No, yeah, well, I just wondered. I mean, how long do people stay? I mean, I guess some just <laughs> uh, grow out of it. It's a good question, Tobin Waltz, and for once I'm happy to answer a question of yours. To become a prefect, you have to have been here for at least a year. Keep in mind that not all of the children in this place have parents and homes to go back to. So this place doubles as an orphanage come foster home just as much as it does a school or care centre or whatever the hell it's called today. And then? So, if you hang around, if you make it, if you last a year or longer, congratulations. You're given the option of becoming a prefect wearing the golden badge and the winner's blue blazer. And when you get too old to be here, but if you're still not right in the head. <laughs> uh, what happens then? Well, then your society's problem. Yeah. But to be honest, we haven't been running for that long. No one joined at the age of 18 and left a year after. The first attendants we had here, they were all you know, years, you know 11, 12 years old. Some of the oldest ones Boys like Isaac, uh, Dylan Polk, they've been here for the duration. They've seen a lot. They've seen a lot of children. Hmm. I've certainly had to endure them in my classes for a long time, and that Dylan is a menace. Yeah. Anyway. You'll need to get to your dorm. I can anticipate the bells about to ring in three, two, one, and the bell rings. <laughs> Bit surprised at that, as he just knows this. Yeah, uh, all right then. Uh, don't be mistaken. We're not friends just because we had this chat. I, I know, Miss. And if anything that I said to you gets to the ears of any others, it will get back to me, and your tongue will pay the price if it wags. I yes, Mr. Greep. Good uh, day, Mr. Greep. Let's get out. I go. Join the flow of students heading towards canteen it's later that night days truly do appear to have rolled into each other and nights no weekends off no time to relax no time to reflect there's been talk of it's just being days that you've been here other people have mentioned it being weeks how long were you behind those walls it's starting to wear on all of you. Really starting to wear on all of you. And Tobin, you are on the second floor, last room, on the left. The north wing. Just as you promised Lana you would be. And Lana appears. She's looking around, looking over her shoulders. Hmm. Give her a nod. Hey. Well, you made it past the prefects, then. Yeah. You're more impressive than you look, Tobin. <laughs> well, you did, too. <laughs> so, do you have the phone? Yeah. Uh, here, I hold it out. It should be fully charged. I haven't used it uh, since I charged it, and it's been off, so... Wow, it's a pretty nice phone as well. Did you, uh, did your parents get this for you, or did what? Did you steal it? No, they got it for me. 
there. Uh, I come from money, <laughs> as they say. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. My stepmother's moneyed. Yeah? Yeah. Too bad you won't get anything of that, I guess. Yeah. Um, not really getting a signal in here, though. Uh, there's construction down one of the other corridors. We could probably get onto the roof and make a call from there if you want to do something a bit exciting. That'd be sick. I'd love to go to the roof, yeah. Ha hardly get out. <laughs> All right, come on. The center is largely in darkness. There's some noise, some rattling, some goings on downstairs. Mostly it's students, the ones who are being dismissed late from the cafeteria, or people just talking over doing their homework in the dorms, but no one is interfering with what you're doing with Lana. You end up reaching a section of the building that is cut off by tarpaulin. You hold it open and you are on a floor that is partly built and partly scaffolding. So I found this place on the first day here when one of the prefects was taking me around they took me up here. I think they were trying to threaten to push me off or something. Oh. Uh, but what I realized was this place is open up. So we can just climb up this and get onto the roof. And away from everyone. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> just low-key strolling on the roof. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it'd be pretty cool. Uh, but you're going to have to help me out. Yeah, okay. Um, I hold my hands out and try to get her something to step on. You don't need to roll to help her up. You're essentially just a static block and she uses you uh, to lift herself up onto a more solid piece of floor where she then scrambles onto the roof. You coming up? Uh, yeah. I look around and then I try to get myself out of there. I've lost some weight over this time, somehow, but <laughs> not much stronger. Could you make a fortitude roll, please? Sure. Hmm. Sixteen. Excellent. You pull yourself up with ease. You are feeling in better shape than you ever were outside, and maybe it's the slim pickings that you're having as meals here or just the sheer stress burning any excess fat off of you but you're a bit more wiry than you ever were and you pull yourself up and find Lana sat on the roof. This is the first time in what seems like a long time where you have been able to see a distance. It actually takes, away, it takes a while for your eyes to get used to the fact that you are looking farther than a wall in a classroom and you can see in the distance the twinkling of lights that imply life is out there somewhere you can see the headlights of cars going by at night road you can see life out there past the walls that surround this place past the security gate and that security gate, those walls, is just another impediment that's stopping you from getting out. Just stop and breathe. Yeah, uh, the, the pin is uh, 3914. Oh, this is going to be... Fucking amazing, okay. Yeah, I say, and I just look down at the walls and the fence. And breathe in the air. And I see the lights. Hey, yeah, yeah, it, I know, it's, it's Lana, it's Lana. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm using some guy's phone. Yeah, I know, I'm, I'm in... I'm still at St. Jude's, yeah, I know, I know. Yes, and... 
Yep, it's as bad as they say. Yeah, it is fucking terrible. I don't know, I made, made one good... There's one good guy here. She gives you a smile. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not just calling for a chat, am I? No. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, that's right, I do want something. Yep. Yeah. You got it. That's it. Breakout. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not going to get in any trouble. How? Of course I... Listen, I'm not going to get you in any trouble. And anyway, even if they got, even if they caught you, you're not going to end up in here. You're too, you're too old for that. They're not going to put you here. <laughs> Listen, if you can make your way here, park outside the... Oh, she looks around. You're not going to want to park in front of the front gate because there's security there. They'll see you. They'll probably move you on. Um, as you're approaching the gate, there's... You, you must be able to get around to the... Listen, if you can get behind the building, do that because... That's where we're going to be trying to climb out. Okay? And we will get into the car there. If you're on either side of the building, then we'll find you. We're just not coming around the front. Okay? And if you can't get the car close enough, then as long as it's nearby, I'll call you as soon as we're over the wall and you can tell us where you are. It looks like this phone has got tracking on it, so I'll be able to find you as long as you... Yeah. Okay. As she talks, I walk uh, along the roof, along the sides of it, look down the fall below, look at how it's structured around the school, like the areas that I haven't seen, and I, I just smell the smells of the time of the year. It's just already a sense of freedom I can taste almost feels so close so real but I look back at Lana as she is talking to whoever that is someone who's older apparently got a car <sighs> I don't know I don't think she really cares about me maybe the thing here is just to let her do her thing and as she does, I'll do mine. And that's how it is. I come back to her. She switches the phone off. She's got a big smile. She wraps her arms around you. She gives you a kiss on the cheek. I uh, uh, hold her. Yeah? You are amazing. Well, when do you think she's he's gonna come? Tomorrow night. Yeah. Yep. So we need to get busy. Oh, we need shit. to work out how we're gonna climb over that wall. Yeah. Where can we go down? Oh, I. What did I see when I was looking around there? What did you see? Well, you saw that the entire centre is surrounded by a concrete lot. North, south, east and west. None of it is divided off. So it is just a building surrounded by concrete. And surrounding the concrete is a large wall. Like you would find as a perimeter wall at a prison. The most startling thing, most remarkable thing... You don't see any sand. And the reason that's remarkable is because you are sure, you are positive that when you were in Dr. Crow's office, through her window, you could see a sandy lot or stretch of land. Yeah. But it is night time, and you are three floors up. Yeah, do I have any idea what direction that would have been? 
Yeah, you you are fairly certain you've passed over it, and it looks the same as the, all the rest of the ground around it. To be honest, uh, and what's most troubling is beyond that is the two questions. One, if this is going to be your method of escape, how you're going to get down from the building, and then two, how you're going to get up the wall and down the other side. Are there any drain pipes or anything? There are. Uh, you don't know how easily they would support your weight and falling down three floors while it's unlikely to kill you it's far enough to break a leg it's not going to help me climb the next wall is it um... but that doesn't dampen Lana's spirits she seems positively giddy, bouncing up and down with excitement. <laughs> this is going to be fantastic. We are going to have such a fantastic time. There's going to be money. We're going to go out. We're going to have some drinks. We might smoke something. And then we don't even have to come back here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, listen, uh, did you see... I've got this all sorted out. That's, that's great. That's going to be great. Uh, did you see any like ladders on the floor we were just at the all among all the construction things uh she scratches her head no mm. i didn't really look i'm gonna need something to get over the walls with yeah yeah i guess mm. i guess we could do it like one of those old movies and tie together bed sheets yeah yeah we could do that to get down yeah that makes sense Take him, yeah. Just take him, and and then if we get enough um, enough bodies on board for this, make enough of a uh, tower outside by the wall, and then two of us can climb to freedom, and they can stay behind, <laughs> like a human ladder kind of thing. Yeah, or a pyramid. Pyramid, yeah. Um, and and who gives a fuck about them if we leave them? Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. This is going to be fucking amazing. Yeah, but just get people that, you know, not going to tell. You know? Do you know who you're going to talk to? Well, Tobin, I'm kind of... I am relying on you a bit. You know, you've got to think. Mm. I've got the car. Yeah. All right, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll... If I see anything... But, you know, I'm kind of relying on you here. All right, yeah. I, th I think I know some some people that I could trust and that really... I mean, who doesn't want to get out, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, she gives you two thumbs up and a big smile. Right, let's get back. Let's get back to the dorms before the prefects start doing head counts. And I kind of wish I could just stay there and hold her a bit longer. Um... But uh, she goes, and I, I, I follow like a sad dog. Emily, are you still in the cafeteria, or have you retired to the dorm, or are you doing something otherwise? Emily has retired to her dorm. And what is on her mind right now? Her monkey. Mm-hmm. That's that's everything to her, so she is that's her obsession. She asks everyone she can find if they've seen her monkey anywhere. Only to get disappointed when they say no. So she's sitting on her bed trying to think of how to get it back. Hey, one of the girls comes over to you. Hey, Emily, isn't it? Yeah. I'm Benita. I saw you... Uh... I, d I don't have any drugs. Hmm? I don't have... I don't have anything you want. <sighs> I heard... I saw how you were in Edgewood's class. I assumed you had something. Not right now. Well, where are you keeping them, then? Maybe I can find them. I just want my monkey. Yeah, I've got your monkey. 
What? I've got your monkey. Just tell me where the pills are. Show me it. No, no, no. Show me, me it. Show me it. It needs food. Shh, shh. Do you want to get the prefect's attention? I want to see it. Listen, the last few days have been really rough for me, and I would just like to take the edge off. Just tell me where you're keeping your pills. Why did you find it? Tell me where you're keeping your pills, and I'll get you your fucking monkey. If you do not get me my fucking pills, I will kill your monkey. I will burn it. No. Um. It won't be the first thing I have burned. You look like you were having the time of your life in that classroom. Where are you keeping the pills? Has Emily been getting a steady supply of pills? No, no, she just got, got the single prescription pill pot that she gave to Francis Coachman. Rattler. One of the prefects. I, I, can, I can get you pills, but... Okay, well, when you get me pills, I'll get you your monkey. But if it takes longer than a night, uh, I'm going to start sending you your monkey piece by piece. Which bit do you want first? You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we played the scenario It Started and Ended with Screams for Cult Divinity Lost, from the upcoming Screams and Whispers scenario collection. The scenario was written by our friend Matthew Dawkins, who is also our Game Master. Joining Craig and Yalmer was the talented Clara Herbal. The music was made by Atrium Carceri and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Check out their website at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for some moody, dark ambient. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Horshobear, Nastasha Rollerson, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, and Ludwig Manford for their generous support. And we would of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Indie Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember, death is only the beginning.